What is the most common chief complaint of a person that walks into your office? Uh, is it lower back pain? That would be my guess. Yeah, majority is low back. Okay, yeah. so what are the most common causes of lower back pain that you see? Um, across the board, if, if they're suffering from, uh, you know, low back pain, uh, whether it's acute or chronic, usually there's an underlying pattern of that, uh, lack of, or the inefficient activation of the, the deep stabilizing system and more of a tendency towards that extension compression you know, uh, activation, that overactivation of flexor extensor. So, you Explain know, you, what that means in a bit more detail, given the ubiquity of this injury right. and the probability that, uh, 80% of the people listening to this have already have experienced back pain. back pain or right. will experience back pain in their lives. I want to make sure if people take nothing away from this podcast, they understand the etiology of lower back pain. Yeah. So, unless you've had a, let's say a car accident or a, a fall, that's like an acute injury. Um, that can be a cause of, of low back pain. The majority that I see, it's more of a, uh, chronic overload over time that, uh, if we have that strategy of, of flex too much flexor extensor activity, which compromises the positioning of the intersegmental, the, the joints and the transfer of force and load, then with the comp compensatory pattern, we'll see more of a hinging in through that lumbar sacral region. And with that hinging over time, you know, it's like if you keep bending a spoon, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna break, you weaken the, uh, the structure. So, you know, uh, take a disc pro. Uh, yeah. Let's, you know, let's, yeah. let's talk about the actual anatomy. And I, yesterday I said, I wished I'd brought a skeleton. So the, the sacrum is a, is basically a single bone. It's actually fused. So it, it, at one point it was multiple right. bones. Sacrum but, with the ilium. Yeah. Right. So, so you have this sort of one fused sacrum and then you have these five lumbar discs numbered one through five. Now between each of those lumbar um, vertebral bodies is a disc. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's one between the, uh, fifth lumbar vertebral body and the, uh, sacrum. So, uh, we refer to them as, you know, L3, L4 is the disc between three mm -hmm. and four and L5 S1 is the disc between there. Right. Um, behind each of these vertebral bodies. So these, these vertebral bodies are sort of held in place, um, by the discs, but then also by the facet joints yes. that run behind them. And it's really difficult to show this. We'll probably have to pull up some images uh, yeah. to make this easier for people to see. Um, but the, the facet joints and the, and then sort of the lamina, which are these, those sort of longer bones hold it all together, but they don't really provide this support. I think the support is probably at the facet joints and at the disc interface. Is that probably fair? Yeah. And then think of all the musculature as the scaffolding yeah. and the, you know, the levers and, you know, uh, that help with that stabilization. And then the, the activation of, of that deep stabilization as an uprighting effect. And let's talk about which muscles are on the front of that. So if you were to cut me open here mm -hmm. and let's just say you pull everything out of the way. So you pull my bowel out of the way, you pull everything and you go yeah. right down onto my spine. What are the muscles you're going to see that are attached to the anterior or front portion of my vertebral bodies? So two, two main ones that we can talk about is the psoas, which, uh, attaches to those transverse processes of the, the lumbar spine. And then the quadratus lumborum, uh, which also attaches to those processes. Both of those, they, with those attachments, they also come up and they attach right where the, the diaphragm attaches the crura of the, of the diaphragm. So, you know, if you, and again, maybe you can pull up those images and or put it on the show notes. Um, so you see, uh, the, um, all those kind of coalescing in that thoracic lumbar region. If, 
if I have that ideal activation of that descending of the diaphragm and the facilitation of that intra-abdominal pressure, that pressure again loads the, the, the abdominal wall and creates that fixed point that the psoas and the uh, quadratus um, are, are anchoring off of. If that's compromised, they don't have anything to anchor off of. And then you, you see that excessive extension and that overload of those facet joints. And with so show, exaggerate what the extension posture looks like so people can see it. So, uh, you'll, you, your hips will, will move forward. So you'll you're, if you picture your pelvis as a bowl, you're tipping the bowl forward, tipping the bowl forward. And then if you think of your rib cage, your rib cage is coming forward as well. Um, so yeah. your spine, which normally has a bend in it gets more of a bend. Excessive. Yeah. yeah. And with that, uh, uh, oblique position of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, now there's a, a mechanical uh, disadvantage of the abdominal wall. So we took a cylinder that's supposed to sit like this and, and we, we made it, it like go that. like this. So now uh, the tendency is going to be the extensor overactivity and the flexor, the psoas. So now you're just getting this repetitive compression on those facet joints and the disc is getting this repetitive uh, hinging flexion. And then in the center of the disc, we have the, 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 the fluid or the, the nucleus working its way through those annular fibers as they weaken. And then that's where you get the disc uh, protrusions protrusion, yeah. or, you know, it's, uh, substance can leak out and the body will, you know, go into that, that spat, that protective spasm. Also, so you'll, you'll see the disc injury, but then you also see over time facet hypertrophy. So the, the degenerative changes and the accumulation of, of bony material trying to help stabilize. So part of my story and kind of discovering uh, our, drove me into uh, utilizing DNS, discovering Prague School, I developed what was called a spondylolysis, which is a uh, uh, um, stress fracture in the spine, part of the, the, the pars, which is, you know, kind of that, that arch that attaches the vertebra and then the, to the facet joints. So for me with overtraining, uh, poor recovery, uh, poor postural foundations, um, I was premature and, um, looking back, knowing what I know now, looking at pictures or videos of myself, I could see that, that compensatory pattern. It didn't catch up to me till, till college, you know, especially as we're younger, we have a huge ability to compensate and we can get away with stuff. But in college, it caught up to me with, the uh, with that, that stress fracture. So, um, I was kind of like the poster boy of upper and lower cross syndrome and lack of efficient, uh, stabilizing strategy. I had plenty of motivation and drive and, and practice, you know, hour upon hour, but at a certain point, you know, structure overload of, you know, in that, that for me, L4, L5 region that gave way. And when that gave way, um, then I went into this whole chronic pain cycle and it wasn't until, uh, you know, I went orthopedist, uh, physical therapist, chiropractic, all of them helped in their own way, but it was, I was missing. I knew there was something missing. So probably for selfish reasons, I went into this profession trying to figure out my own pain and try to figure out how to recover. And, uh, you know, in, in medical school and same in chiropractic school, first year, you're just getting bombarded with all anatomy, physiology, functional biomechanics. All of it was amazing and interesting, but I'm like, this isn't helping me. It wasn't until the second year where I was introduced to, uh, Prague school 
Yonda and Levitt and what they were teaching, it was like, oh, finally something made sense. And just intuitively it made sense to, to what I was dealing with. So I started to you know, learn more and more about that while I was in school, uh, incorporating some of the treatment methods and the, the exercises. And that, that got me you know, further along of kind of pulling myself out of uh, my own kind of chronic pain. And then in, uh, once I was out of school, uh, 97, 98, um, after a few years, there was a clinician, uh, Dr. Liebenson, taking small groups over to Prague to learn from those, the, you know, those pioneers and those, those Prague therapists. Um, so I was able to go over there. It was like an eight-day uh, intensive kind of lectures and, and workshops. Got to see Levitt. Uh, but unfortunately, the year before, uh, Yonda had passed away. And I believe Voita had passed away, I think, early 2000, 2000 2001. Um, but that's, that was my uh, first introduction to uh, Professor Pavel Kolaj. And at that time, it was his ideas talking about developmental kinesiology and then utilizing that that knowledge to develop the assessments and the, the treatment strategies, not only, you know, to the cerebral palsy population, but then, you know, he's talking about the adults and then, and then the sports population. So once I saw that again, that was like another light bulb and another piece of that puzzle for me to, to work my way out of it, out of my own uh, situation. Um, and then from 2003, basically I've watched this, this evolution of DNS, the concepts and principles turn into the actual name and then the curriculum of, of where we're at now. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.